Hi, this is Dr. Serendis, and I will be speaking on the topic of the role of the nurse educator. Florence Nightingale is considered the founder of modern nursing. She established nursing as a respectable profession for women. In 1860, she established St. Thomas Hospital and the Nightingale Training School for Nurses in London, England, which is pictured on the right. Historians generally agree that her greatest contribution was in efforts to promote educational programs for nurses. In 1873, the Bellevue Hospital School of Nursing of New York City was founded. It was the first school of nursing in the United States to be founded on the principles of nursing established by Florence Nightingale. The school operated at Bellevue Hospital until its closure in 1969. And over to the right, you see the pin that um, was actually the first um, school of nursing pin. It was um, Bellevue Hospitals. What little formal classroom education that took place consisted mostly of classes taught by physicians. The picture to the right depicts a lecture by a physician on bandaging. Students worked from 5.30 a.m. until 9 p.m. and slept in rooms near the wards. The apprenticeship model is the term given to the manner in which nurses were educated up until the middle of the 20th um, century. They basically learned on the job and they worked long hours with little if any supervision. Students worked without pay, essentially as free staff for the hospital. Upon graduation, most nurses worked within the home as private duty nurses. Um, really, graduate nurses did not remain in the hospital. Nursing students, therefore, were responsible for staffing the hospitals along with a nursing superintendent, usually one nursing superintendent for the entire hospital. Despite attempts by the National League for Nursing to standardize nursing curriculum and advocating for improved nursing education along with the American Nurses Association and other different groups, um, hospital authorities continued to control the schools of nursing. Classes were irregularly scheduled and were often canceled when students were needed to staff the wards. Nursing education took little more than two years to learn, during which time uh, nursing students worked seven days a week, 14 hours a day. They had one afternoon off um, for church services per week, usually between the hours of 12 p.m. and 2 p.m. Students rotated several shifts during a week. In 1917, Anna Maxwell established an affiliation between the Diploma Nursing Program at Presbyterian Hospital and also Teachers College, which later became known as Columbia University. This provided the impetus um, for an establishment of a five-year program leading to a Bachelor of Science degree from Columbia University. This was the first collegiate nursing program in the country. Um, Columbia Nursing in 1956 also um, established the country's first master's degree in clinical nursing specialty program. In 1920, the Rockefeller Foundation named a committee which included Annie Goodrich, Adelaide Nutting, and Lillian Wall to study nursing education in the United States. The report published in 1923 is known as the Goldmark Report. This report concluded that for nursing to be on equal footing with other disciplines, nursing education should occur in the university setting with training based on an educational plan rather than on service needs. Nursing education began to change. Education of nursing students in the 1950s predominantly took place in diploma programs, although experimentation with associate degree programs was beginning to take place. Um, such programs focused on a clinically based curriculum along with established classroom lectures by nursing faculty. And indeed, in the early 1950s, Mildred Montague proposed and created a two-year associate degree of nursing program. 
to provide technically skilled nurses to meet the immediate demand until enough baccalaureate degree nurses could be trained. A nursing um, shortage existed at the time uh, due to post-World War II era, and so associate degree programs were really not meant to last. They were meant to be a stopgap until enough BSN educated um, nurses um, could take their place. However, uh, the two-year associate degree programs remain popular today. The role of nurses became more complex, and this is due to changes in science as well as technology. In the 1920s, 2000 diploma schools of nursing existed, while less than 40 are open today, and these are mostly um, in the northeastern United States. As we look at these pictures, we can see that through many of the decades, nursing has become much more complicated. Now let's begin by discussing the origin of the role of the professional nurse educator, also known in the past as a st staff development educator. This was previously referred to um, as that role, and in 1928 we also begin to see the word in-service and in-service education taking hold. And we begin to see in the literature articles about in-service education. By 1953, the in-service education role began to separate from that of nursing administrator and divisions of in-service education were established within departments of nursing service. The role is thought to have begun in response to an increase in new graduates remaining in the hospital to practice and not going out to private duty nursing as they had in the past upon graduation and also the need for more nurses. Later, their role became more important as technology and patient acuity increased. In 1966, the Nursing Service Administrator Section of the American Nurses Association developed a statement of functions and qualifications for in-service educators. This was the precursor to the current American Nurses Association Scope and Standards for Professional Nurse Educator, which you see before you. By 1970, in-service education was subsumed under continuing education, which had come to include all education that took place outside of degree-granting nursing school programs. So the roles of a professional nurse educator began to include hospital orientation, formal orientation to specialty units with courses such as an ICU course, IV insertion, electrocardiogram interpretation, and we also had in-service education, which were planned education um, programs for employees held in the institution to increase their competency, and also continuing education to further their continuing um, professional development. Now, the National Nursing Staff Development Organization was originated in 1989 through the work of Dr. Belinda Pletz. This organization was renamed the Association for Nursing Professional Development in 2012 to better describe the role. The original journal came out in five years before the development of the organization, and it was known as the Journal of Nursing Staff Development. Now, the journal was printed from 1985 to 1998. Later, this journal was renamed the Journal for Nurses in Professional Development and existed from 2013 and continues to exist up to the present time. Currently, we have a, a very severe faculty nursing shortage, so we have a total of 880 faculty vacancies uh, that were identified in a survey of 556 nursing schools that had both a baccalaureate and um, or a graduate um, degree in uh, nursing program. Besides the vacancies, schools also cited the need to create an additional 257 faculty positions to accommodate student demand. The data show a national nursing faculty vacancy rate of 6.9%. Most of those vacancies 
90.6% were faculty positions requiring or preferring a doctoral degree. We also have a gap in the diversity of nursing faculty. And what we are faced with is the fact that we need to, we are challenged to provide a culturally representative faculty student ratio. And this is in anticipation of the emerging minority student population. Minorities make up less than 13.1% of baccalaureate nursing faculty, and 5.5% are men. Many of these minority professors are rapidly nearing retirement age. Faculty responsibilities include such things as teaching and learning as a core responsibility, self-governance within the university setting, mentorship of junior faculty and students, evaluation of students, colleagues, courses, programs, continuous quality improvement, scholarships such as publications and presentations and research, and service to university, school, community, and professor, profession. And as you can see, this professor over here is juggling quite a few balls. And so what we also begin to see is that we have um, Boyer's model of scholarship. This was introduced by Ernest Boyer in 1990. And it's considered an academic model, and it advocates for the expansion of the traditional definition of scholarship and research into four types of scholarship. Now, Ernest Boyer's vision was to change the research mission of universities by introducing the idea that scholarship needed to be brought and um, made more flexible, especially for practice disciplines, for example, such as nursing. The four categories that he established are the scholarship of teaching and learning, the scholarship of integration, the scholarship of discovery, and the scholarship of engagement. And we're going to go into each one of those. Now, the scholarship of teaching and learning, which is the first, is the demonstration of clinical specialty and education knowledge as you teach, demonstration of effective teaching and evaluation strategies, development of innovative programs, use of a variety of innovative teaching methods, advancing learning theory through classroom research, as well as professional role modeling. The scholarship of integration includes publications and other products that use concepts and original works from nursing and other disciplines in order to create new patterns or placing that knowledge in a more meaningful context. Integration of knowledge is from various disciplines into the nursing practice. The, and also making one a productive member of interdisciplinary, or we can also think of this as interprofessional teams. So the scholarship of integration is really to take nursing along with other disciplines and consider how we can work together to create new knowledge. The scholarship of discovery builds new knowledge through research uses scientific methods to develop a strong knowledge base for the discipline, develops evidence-based practice, mentorship of junior researchers, and publications and presentations of research. And so we can see at the heart of this that what we have here in the scholarship of discovery is evidence-based practice. Now the scholarship of engagement used to be called the scholarship of application or practice. And so some people still think of it in terms of those words. Now this is very much the performance of service connected with your area of, of expertise while working in a clinical setting, the mentoring of others also in that clinical setting, service in community organizations, evidence-based practice in the clinical setting, research conducted in the clinical setting, and professional development to maintain clinical competency. Now there is an appointment process in academia. Um, basically, um, you have tenure and tenured positions. A tenured um, professor has an appointment that lasts until retirement age, except for dismissal with just cause. And the two main reasons for that cause would be lascivious behavior or financial insolvency of the institution itself. For a tenure position, 
one must have their terminal degree. And for example, in nursing, that would be a doctorate. You have to be at the institution usually for five years, and that's so that you can build up a dossier to show your worthiness for being tenured. Uh, the dossier is really a very large and in-depth um, portfolio. A vote is made by the faculty as to whether you should be um, appointed tenure. Then that vote is sent to the dean, who can approve or deny it, and then once it is approved by the dean of a particular school or college, then it moves on for final approval by the president and board of trustees of the institution. And I have to tell you that the president and board of trustees, that's really just an official um, nod uh, towards the appointment and just agreeing that they're setting aside funds because the funds need to be set aside because the individual will receive a raise in the upcoming um, year. Now, non-tenured faculty, they have a contract um, for a set period of years. It's usually one or two or three years. That contract ends. Their role ends at the end of that period unless it is rolled over for another contract with another set number of years. Now, we also have what's called a non-probationary instructional um, role. Um, and what this is, this is, um, you, you may see in uh, different ads, for an instructor for one year, and usually that's someone to fill a position due to someone being off on uh, medical leave, or maybe that person has moved to be a visiting professor just for that year at another institution. And so this is just an annual one-year appointment, and then the if the university doesn't need you, um, then your position ends. Now rank is the system of promotion that's used for full-time faculty. The lowest rank is instructor, and the highest rank is professor, or what is also called full professor. Rank indicates the significant work that has been accomplished in research, teaching, and community service. I want to add here the adjunct faculty role, um, because some of you may be in that type of role in other institutions in which you work. Uh, that's a part-time faculty member. Now, the National League for Nursing established um, core competencies for nurse educators in 2005, and this was really to be consistent with the fact and, and in concert with the fact that they were establishing a certified nurse educator exam. And so first you have to establish, you know, what does the practice of nurse ed educators include? Well, to facilitate learning, facilitate learner development and socialization, use assessment and evaluation strategies, Participate in curriculum design and evaluation of program outcomes. Function as a change agent and leader. Pursue continuous quality improvement in the nurse educator role. Engage in scholarship. Function within the educational environment. Now, if we compare that, the competencies of the professional nurse educator, who, as you can see, wears many hats, they're a facilitator of learning. You're going to see these aren't much different. A change agent a leader, a mentor, a champion of scientific inquiry, a partner for role transition, an advocate for the NPD specialty. Now I'd like to add here that the specifics for the competencies, which are much more in depth, are found in the American Nurses Association scope and standards of practice for the NPD. Now here, um, what you have is the Nursing Professional Development Specialist Practice Model. And it uses a systems theory model of inputs, throughputs, and outputs. And we can see here that the inputs are the learner and the NPD specialist in concert, and the outcome are the protection of the public along with provision of quality care. And that would be the outcome. Now the throughputs, evidence-based practice and making that evidence-based practice actually using it in practice and then surrounding that are also the many roles of the NPD specialist. Now nurse educators, no matter which type, um, need to have their role developed through an orientation program, mentorship is extremely important, which we'll be talking about, and also through continuing education. Nurse educators can also provide consultation. They do so by providing consultation services to influence plans, enhance the abilities of others, and effect change.
consultation services can be provided for accreditation. And I think of joint commission in hospitals or the um, CCNE um, and ACEN and other types of nursing accreditation that occurs within our schools of nursing. Along with the needs assessment, organizational change, educational presentations, um, perhaps, among many. Now, nurse educators are evaluated, of course, and it's the same, similar, I should say, no matter what role you are. Um, and so we have, excuse me, we have um, student or learner evaluations. We have peer evaluations. Evaluations by our supervisors and then our own self-evaluation. So you can keep a portfolio, um, whether you're a nurse educator in a professional development role or also whether you're in the academic role. <clears throat> Pardon me. That portfolio can be used for a promotion process, however it exists in a hospital or other clinical setting. And also for academic role, it is used for both promotion and tenure um, process. Um, we use a portfolio, and as I explained earlier, it is a dossier, which is a much more formal and expanded um, portfolio. Uh, now, if you have any questions, um, please place them in the discussion board for that purpose so that we can all um, discuss this. Thank you so much.